Okay. Hi everybody. I'm Onur Umcalılar from Mimar Sinan University in Istanbul. So welcome to the second and last plenary talk of our meeting uh, to be given by Professor Stephen Gervin. Uh, it is probably needless for the experts in the audience, yeah, but especially for those of you who are new to the field, I'd like to give a brief biographical information about Professor Gervin. Uh, after completing his undergraduate studies in Bates College, Professor Gervin earned his PhD degree in theoretical physics from Princeton University in 1977. And he joined Yale University in 2001, uh, where he is currently Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Professor of Applied Physics. Starting from 2007, he served as Yale's Deputy Provost for Research for 10 years. Uh, in 2020 and 21, he served as Founding Director uh, of the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage. Uh, throughout his career, Professor Gervin's research has focused on theoretical studies of uh, strongly correlated low-dimensional many-particle systems, such as the fractional quantum ball ones. Uh, since coming to Yale, his interests have moved to atomic physics, the quantum optics, and quantum computation. And along with his experimental colleagues, uh, Professor Gervin co developed circuit quantum electrodynamics, to which he will uh, start introducing us in a minute. Uh, before Starting, I would like to remind the audience, including those following us on YouTube, that you can type your questions through the chat facility, uh, Zoom or YouTube as well, and I'll try to ask as many of them as time permits. And Professor Gervin actually said that uh, students can ask questions, uh, interrupt and ask questions as well during his talk. So as you prefer. So it's time to enjoy an illuminating talk. Uh, please, Professor Gurgen, uh, the microphone is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ona. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I, I do encourage students to ask questions uh, during the talk. If I say something that uh, confuses you, it's better to... Um, ask and uh, find try to uh, understand what's going on rather than uh, wait until the end. So, um, so I'm a theoretician, but I, I work closely with uh, my uh, experimental colleagues here at Yale on circuit QED, which is really applying the ideas of quantum optics to superconducting electrical circuits uh, where we the atom the role of the atoms is played by superconducting qubits and the role of the laser from atomic physics is played by a microwave photon a microwave signal generator so I'm going to try to give you an introduction to this topic and then one recent uh, interesting quantum simulation uh, ex experiment. So quantum electrodynamics is the study of atoms and electrons coupled to photons. And the essential piece of physics is that the vacuum, the electromagnetic vacuum, is uh, filled with zero point fluctuations of the electric field. And these zero point fluctuations have many physical effects. For example, when you learn about the spectrum of hydrogen, you, you learn that the, uh, there are quantized energy levels, stationary states that live forever. But in fact, they don't live forever. The excited states can decay towards the ground state or towards a lower state by spontaneously emitting a photon. 
And uh, this is caused by the zero point fluctuations of the electromagnetic field in the vacuum, making these excited states unstable to decay. And the hydrogen atom 2p state has a lifetime of about a nanosecond uh, uh, before it um, emits a photon. You can also have electrons which virtually emit and reabsorb photons. And these virtual processes cause shifts in atomic energy levels. For example, when you first study the hydrogen atom, you find out that the 2s and 2p levels are exactly degenerate. But when you include the fluctuations of the electromagnetic vacuum, you find that they're split apart by what's called the Lamb shift, a very tiny uh, shift in frequency. The thing I'm going, circuit QED is the analog of what's called cavity QED in atomic physics. And it's the study of what happens when you replace the continuous spectrum of electromagnetic modes with a discrete spectrum by enclosing the system, putting it between mirrors or enclosing it in a microwave cavity where now only discrete frequencies of photon modes are allowed. And we use the, this effect, the, the change in the vacuum fluctuation spectrum uh, to enhance the lifetime of our superconducting qubits by a factor of a thousand. Uh, and we do so by arranging the frequency of the photons that are allowed in the cavity to be different than the frequency, the transition frequency of our uh, artificial atom. So uh, in atomic physics, you can do microwave cavity QED with Rydberg atoms. Here's a picture from Serge Sharosh's Nobel lecture. He sends uh, Rydberg atoms where the electron is in the, say, 50th circular orbit. And it goes into a regi region, a cavity that has a small number of microwave photons in it. It possibly makes a transition from the 50th to the 51st uh, uh, state. And then you detect that transition by measuring the state of the atoms after they have interacted with the photons. And depending on how long the length of time they spent inside the cavity, they will uh, undergo Rabi oscillations where they transition back and forth between the, the, what we call the ground and excited states of the, of the qubit. Instead of measuring the state of the atoms, you can also have an, an optical cavity QED. You have two mirrors. You drop a cloud of adium, atoms through there. Uh, and these days, you can even trap those atoms in there. And you measure changes in the transmission of photons through the resonator, through this resonant cavity. So instead of measuring the state of the atoms, you measure the state of the photons to see how they are interacting. In circuit QED, we use, as I mentioned, microwave photons inside superconducting circuits and resonators, and we use artificial atoms, Josephson junction qubits. And we these artificial atoms are very large and millimeter scale, and they give ultra strong photon atom coupling that lets us do nonlinear quantum optics at the level of one or two microwave photons. So here's uh, you know, a natural atom, the, the hydrogen atom uh, on Angstrom or uh, you know, Bohr radius on a, on a side. It has a characteristic transition frequency of 10 to the 15 hertz, uh, a lifetime of a uh, little bigger than a nanosecond. If you think of that as approximately a harmonic oscillator, uh, 
it would have a Q that is the frequency times the lifetime of about 4 million. And the transition dipole moment, the ability, the matrix element to absorb a single photon, uh, it corresponds to an electron moving uh, a Bohr radius, which is uh, called a Debye. Uh, and our artificial atoms are on a much different scale. They're electrical circuits made of uh, superconducting aluminum cooled to near absolute zero. They're about one millimeter in size. Uh, their characteristic oscillation frequencies for the charge going back and forth through this Josephson junction is in the microwave regime, uh, gigahertz, 10 gigahertz. The lifetime can be 300 to 1,000 microseconds, uh, even larger these days. And the corresponding Q is uh, similar to that of, of hydrogen. But the transition dipole moment, the matrix element for coupling to electric field is uh, 30 million times larger because it corresponds to several Cooper pairs of electrons moving a millimeter instead of one electron moving uh, an angstrom. So here's uh, an electron micrograph of a, a sort of older version of the kind of qubit that we use. And the key, the key element is the Josephson junction. It's a, a tunnel junction between one piece of aluminum and another piece of aluminum. You see it's just uh, maybe 2,000 atoms on a side. And the two pieces of metal superconductor are separated by a thin oxide tunnel barrier, which you see illustrated schematically here. And it's the uh, fact that uh, Cooper pairs of electrons in the superconductor act like waves and are able to tunnel through this forbidden barrier to the other side that um, that gives the artificial atom its um, anharmonic energy level structure. Without that, you would just have what's effectively an LC resonator, inductor capacitor electromagnetic resonator. But the this tunneling property of the Josephson junction makes this act like a nonlinear inductor. Um, and gives the, um, instead of the even, evenly spaced levels of a harmonic oscillator, gives you unevenly spaced levels like in an atom, which is what we need to make a qubit. Uh, so here you see uh, a close up of a sort of modern version of this so called transmon qubit. There's a piece of sapphire, very good insulator. There are two thin films of superconducting aluminum, and then a tiny uh, Josephson junction uh, connecting the two halves of this millimeter long antenna. So you can think of this as an artificial atom with an atomic number of 10 to the 12 just a huge number of free electrons in here. So you would think that the spectrum would be even more complicated than the spectrum of uranium or some other heavy atom. But in fact, because uh, it's um, superconducting, uh, all of the electrons travel coherently in pairs as if they were in a single quantum state and they slosh, they move back and forth between the two sides of the antenna in a very simple way, which gives you a very simple spectrum, just that of an anharmonic oscillator. So here's a quantized energy level, a transition at say five gigahertz and then the next transition is say 4.9 gigahertz. It's slightly smaller frequency. And so by choosing our frequency carefully, we can just cause transitions between these two levels and ignore other levels uh, in the atom. 
And so the spectrum is actually simpler than that of hydrogen, even though there are a trillion uh, electrons. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's no fine structure, no hyperfine structure. And the quality factor, as I mentioned, is comparable to that of hydrogen. But it has its own antenna built in. And so it's able to couple very, very strongly to the vacuum fluctuations, the zero point electric field fluctuations of the microwave cavity. And that's how we, uh, we, we take great advantage of uh, this system to do nonlinear quantum optics in what we call circuit QED. So, um, so let's understand now how we gain quantum control of this hybrid system that consists of a, an empty box, a centimeter scale box surrounded by superconducting walls that trap microwave photons. And inside the box is one of these transmon uh, qubits. That will focus on one particular electromagnetic mode of the, the box. And it, it's a harmonic oscillator. It, its energy is given by some uh, Planck's constant times the frequency times A dagger A, the number of photons in the oscillating mode. We're going to approximate the this anharmonic spectrum of the qubit, we're just going to focus on the lowest two levels. And when you have a lowest two levels, you can think of that as an artificial spin one half. And this spin operator sigma z, which is minus one in the ground state and plus one in the excited state, uh, this coefficient represents the energy omega q necessary to excite the qubit. And then the uh, dipole coupling between the photons and the atom allow them to exchange energy. But if you work in what's called the dispersive regime, where the energy of a photon is not the same this number is not the same as that number, the energy needed to excite the qubit, then this coupling only acts virtually or in second order perturbation theory. You can absorb a photon, but then energy is not conserved, so you quickly re-emit it. And when you calculate the effect of that, you get this dispersive term that you see here, some number chi, the dispersive shift, times sigma z times a dagger a. And I can give two different interpretations of this term. One is that the coefficient of a dagger a, which I call the cavity frequency, now depends on whether the qubit is in z is plus one or minus one. So the cavity frequency depends on the state of the qubit. Or I can say, no, it's the coefficient of sigma z, which is the um, frequency of the qubit, now depends on how many photons are in the cavity. And atomic physicists call that the light shift. And because of uh, uh, the very strong coupling of our atoms to the photons, this number here can be uh, hundreds of thousands of times larger than you would get in uh, ordinary atomic physics. And this number can be, you know, 3,000 times larger than the line width and the dissipation rates of either the cavity or the qubit. So that's where all our ability to control things comes from. In addition to this Hamiltonian, we can turn on a microwave drive, which will excite, remove, and add and remove photons from the cavity through this term. And we can turn on another drive, which at the qubit frequency, which can excite and de-excite the qubit. And so this Hamiltonian gives you what's called universal control. You can make any quantum state in principle using this Hamiltonian and these controls. 
And in particular, you can displace the cavity. You can excite the oscillator in a way that depends on the state of the qubit. And you can rotate the qubit in a way that depends on the state of the cavity. And I'll explain more about this. So here's an example of universal control. So here's a cavity. And I can have a drive that excites the oscillator mode that's inside this cavity. And I can have another drive which excites the qubit, which is coupled into the cavity here. And I can start with zero photons and the qubit in the ground state. And I can try to put exactly six photons in the cavity and leave the qubit in the ground state. And I do that by uh, applying some complicated uh, electromagnetic pulse to the qubit and a different one to the cavity. And I calculate this, uh, the needed pulse uh, from uh, numerical optimization techniques, knowing the Hamiltonian. And here you see a plot of the photon number in the cavity. And it starts at zero, and it rises up, and it wiggles around. It splits into different values. And then all of a sudden, at 500 nanoseconds, the, all the probability collapses on to n equals 6. And here you see the, the photon number probability distribution uh, is exactly 6. And here you see a plot of a measurement uh, of what's called the Wigner function. It's a quasi-probability distribution in phase space. This is the position of the oscillator, the electric field. This is the momentum of the oscillator, the magnetic field in the cavity. And you see it's completely rotationally symmetric. And that's just an illustration of the number phase uncertainty principle. We know the number exactly, so we're completely uncertain what the phase of the electromagnetic field is. And uh, we have a way of making these measurements, uh, which I won't go into, but it's based on our ability to measure the parity of the photon number. Is it even or odd? And I'll explain how we do that later. Um, so here's uh, some other uh, example of uh, our ability to control. This is the so-called Gottesman kataev preskill uh, error correction code states that you can make in both uh, superconducting cavities and in um, trapped ion uh, systems. And it's essentially a, a kind of Schrodinger cat that lives in 35 different places at once in phase space. And you can use this universal control to be, build these beautiful, um, complicated superpositions of different numbers of photons in the cavity. OK, so that's illustrations of the kind of control you can achieve, which is very, um, um, very much easier, I would say, than in traditional quantum optics because of the strong dispersive coupling. Now, in addition to creating states, we have to me make measurements of them to see what we have. And we're going to use the same Hamiltonian to do that. So here's, here's an example of a measurement. Uh, is the photon number equal to one, yes or no? So that, that question yields one bit of information. And the way we answer that question is we map the answer onto the state of the ancilla qubit that's coupled to the cavity. We could ask, is it one photon, yes or no? Is it 13 photons, yes or no? This is not a very efficient way to find out how many photons there are. Um, let's say there are 256 possible photon numbers. And if you say, is it zero, is it one, is it two, is it three? The answer will be no most of the time. But still, 
so it's inefficient sampling, but you can still get the answer. Now, how to, and I'll illustrate this first, and then I'll show you a more efficient method. So how do we do that? Well, here's the circuit. The cavity is in some superposition of different numbers of photons. Our ancilla qubit is in the ground state. And I'm going to carry out a unitary rotation of the qubit by an angle that depends on how many photons are in the cavity. And then I'm going to measure the qubit to see if its state changed. So in particular, I'm going to rotate the qubit by an angle of pi around the x-axis. I'm going to take it from 0 to 1 if and only if there are exactly m photons in the cavity. Otherwise, I'm not going to rotate it. So if I see the qubit change state, I know there are exactly m photons in the cavity. Well, how do I, how, that works in principle, but how do I do it in practice? Well, I use this same Hamiltonian and, uh, I notice that the trend, the frequency of light, of microwave light, that you need to uh, flip the qubit from ground to excited shifts by two chi for each photon that I add to the cavity. So here's the spectrum of the qubit. If there are zero photons, uh, the uh, spectral line is at this frequency. If there's one photon, it's here. If there's two, it's here. If there's three, it's here. So if I send in a microwave pulse, a pi pulse, which will just has the right amplitude and frequency to flip the qubit from zero to one, uh, it will be on resonance and will flip the qubit if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity. If there are two or three or zero, this photon will not have the right energy to be absorbed. And so that's how I can execute this. If I, another uh, thing I could do is shine two microwave tones, one at this frequency, one at this frequency. And that will answer the question, is the photon number equal to either one or three? It still has one bit answer, yes or no. But now if you see the qubit flip, you don't know whether it was because this photon was absorbed or that photon was absorbed. Either n equals one or n equals three uh, will cause the same answer. And you can extend this to by uh, applying any tones at any uh, photon number frequency you want to measure any arbitrary binary valued function of the photon number. So I can um, have a string, uh, a binary vector, a string of zeros and ones, and it's zero if I'm not shining a photon at that frequency, and it's a one if I am shining a photon at that frequency. So for this case, uh, C sub one and C sub three would both be one, and uh, this measurement would tell me that either there was one photon or three photons, but I don't know which. I can extend this to a more complex uh, sequence of uh, gates and measurements, which um, will be a very efficient binary search to locate the photon number. So basically, the first um, uh, microwave pulse here, uh, I apply a tone that hits the, that flips the qubit if um, it's in the upper half of the available photon number between 0 and 15, so uh, the top eight numbers. 
then I make a measurement, then I apply a tone which gives me another bit of information in the binary representation of the photon number and so on, down to the last one which tells me whether the photon number is even or odd because I'm applying a tone at, uh, that will flip the qubit if the photon number is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, or 15 and won't flip it if the photon number is even. So by combining together the results of all these measurements, I get four bits of information that tell me whether the, which, what is the value of the photon number between zero and 15. And this, uh, if I went through and measured, are you zero, are you one, are you two, are you three, that search is um, uh, expensive because most of the time the answer is no. But here I get a useful bit of information in the binary representation of the photon number with each measurement. So it takes only logarithm of the maximum number of photons in the distribution. Uh, number of, uh, of circuit depth, number of gates and measurements. So it's exponentially more efficient. So what can we do with this? Well, I can use this to do a hardware efficient quantum simulation of an interesting physical model that contains bosons. So in particular, we're going to do an experiment simulating the optical spectrum of a vibrating molecule. And uh, the spectral line strengths are determined by what are called Frank Condon factors. And it turns out that this is an exam can be mapped onto what's called a boson sampling problem, where you put in, you have many, uh, an interferometer with many ports, and you put in. Uh, specific number of photons at each port, and there's interference, and then you measure where the photons come out. And uh, I'll explain how this works now. So I'm going to use, this is going to be very efficient because I'm going to use microwave bosons to simulate mechanical bosons, the mechanical vibrational modes of a triatomic molecule. And so we're going to focus on two modes, the symmetric stretch mode, where the two, uh, in this case, hydrogen uh, atoms uh, vibrate in phase and the length of their bonds gets longer and shorter. And the anti-symmetric bending mode, where they uh, the opening angle between the two uh, hydrogens, the bonding angle here oscillates in time. And these are mechanical oscillators, and we're going to simulate them. We're going to represent their quantum states by the quantum states of these two microwave oscillators, these resonators, one for stretch and one for bending. And we're going to control and manipulate the quantum states uh, by using these ancilla transmon qubits. And we're going to carry out a simulation that will tell us the spectrum of these molecules. So the, in, uh, the chemistry experiment works like this. I, it's a photo emission. I come in with an ultraviolet or X-ray photon and I eject an electron from one of these bonds. So it breaks the reflection symmetry that you have here between that makes this mode symmetric and this mode anti-symmetric because it removes the electron from only one of the bonds. That changes the, the bond length and the spring constant and causes the molecule to begin vibrating. And the way you describe this, and, and then that leaves behind some vibrational energy in the molecule. And that energy uh, lowers the energy of the photoelectron, which is ejected. And so you can detect by measuring the energy of this electron, 
how much vibrational energy was left behind in the molecule. And sometimes it's three quanta and two quanta, five quanta, and different in, in each of the modes. So the way to think about this is that the chemical bonds form kind of springs, maybe nonlinear springs, and define a potential energy surface that the nuclei slowly move on because they're much more massive than the electrons. And it's a two-dimensional potential energy surface. There's a coordinate for the bending mode and a coordinate for the stretching mode. And this potential well has quantized energy levels. And what happens when you uh, suddenly eject an electron, you change the potential energy surface, but not where you are because the nuclei are heavy. But now you project this state onto a superposition of uh, excited states in the molecule. And you have some probability of leaving behind this many quanta and some probability of this and some probability of this. So here's the first generation uh, experiment. We obtain the nuclear potential energy surface by solving the chemical bonding problem on a classical computer using various approximations. Then we, we approximate that potential energy surface as quadratic. That is, we approximate the mechanical vibrations as harmonic oscillators, at least in this first experiment. We have a new experiment just come out uh, where we go beyond this. But we allow for the, the, the two potential energy surfaces to have different uh, vibrational frequencies. They are displaced from each other. They're squeezed, the spring constants uh, change, and, uh, and uh, we allow the symmetry axis of the surface to rotate because you break the symmetry in the molecule by removing, you break a bond on only one of the two, um, of only one of the two bonds. And then suddenly the electron is removed and you have to perform a unitary transformation between the uh, uh, eigenstates of the old potential energy surface and those of the new potential energy surface. So that's what our quantum computer, our quantum simulator is going to do. So in order to do this simulation, you need some bosonic modes. So we're using microwave cavities. You need various Gaussian operations, such as beam splitters, squeezing, which is just you know, shrinking the uncertainty in position to increase the uncertainty in momentum. And you need displacements, all of which we can do. And you need non-Gaussian state preparation. You need to be able to make Fox states of three photons or seven photons or whatever in each mode. Uh, and then you need to be able to measure how many photons there are in the modes after you've changed the Hamiltonian. And uh, I just showed you a few minutes ago how we do that. So these, these two things are, this, this uh, was originally proposed to be done in optics, and it is being done in optics, but uh, it's much harder to do squeezing and number resolve detection in traditional quantum optics than it is uh, using our circuit QED. So here is the, uh, the program or the, the gate sequence for our little quantum computer. Uh, we have two cavities, Alice and Bob, and three different transmon and cillas. Uh, sorry, for us. yes. Uh, there is a question, I guess, from Levin. Okay, sure. quick, quick question, if I may interrupt. Could you, yes. uh, could you uh, say uh, again how these bending and stretching modes map to the uh, boson sampling uh, analogy? Sure, so, so these are, these nuclear, the vibrations are approximately harmonic oscillators, mechanical oscillators. And you can have uh, uh, one or two or five quanta of excitation in this stretch mode and 
three or four or seven quanta in, in this bending mode. And then I'm going to, uh, if there are three mechanical quanta in this mode, then I will put uh, three microwave photons in this mode. And if there are seven mechanical quanta in this mode, I will put seven photons in this cavity. Does that help? Thanks, yes. Yeah, the frequencies are completely different and so forth, but uh, that doesn't matter. You can sort of scale those differences away. Okay, so, um, so you initialize the qubits in the ground state and the cavities into Fox states with say zero photons here and zero here or one here and three here. You carry out this unitary transformation that changes the basis uh, from uh, one potential energy surface to another. Uh, then you check, there are certain checks we do to make sure that no errors occurred. And then we make a measurement of the number of photons in each cavity mode. And that represents the number of mechanical vibrations that were excited when the chemical bond was broken. And the, the, the transformation that we have to do involves squeezing the first cavity, squeezing the second cavity, doing a rotation of the potential energy surface by forming a beam splitter between the two cavities that mixes them coherently, and then anti-squeezing and anti-squeezing, and then displacements and displacements. And you can show that by uh, doing all the correct gates here, you can uh, simulate this um, uh, chemistry experiment faithfully. So here are, uh, here is uh, a, a theory versus experiment. This is for water, photoionizing to water plus and an electron. And uh, this is the, this scale is the energy, the vibrational energy left behind in the molecule taken away from the electron. The black lines are the ideal uh, spectra, okay? Calculated theoretically because from our model, uh, it's easy to do because it's a very simple uh, model. And then uh, I told you there were two different ways to count how many photons are in a cavity. One is uh, just uh, uh, slow but efficient sampling. You asked, is there zero? Is there one? Is there two? Is there three? And uh, you take thousands and millions of shots and you get the average uh, probability that uh, some certain number of photons was in cavity A and a certain number in cavity B. And then you, that tells you the height of this, uh, this spectral line. We know the frequencies in the mode. So we know energy seven Alice uh, quanta and three Bob quanta would correspond, let's say, to this particular energy left behind in the molecule. And you can see a fairly complicated spectrum and quite good agreement between the experimental results and the, the height of the lines. There's also this more efficient sampling where we, uh, we do four consecutive quantum non-demolition measurements and get the four bits that represent the photon number. It's 32 times faster, but it's a little bit less accurate, as you can see. Uh, so how do, we, how do we measure how close our experimental probability distribution is to the theoretical one? Well, you can measure that what's called the L1 norm distance between the exact and experimental distribution. So this is the probability experimentally that there are I quanta in 
the Alice mode and J quanta in the Bob mode, and this is the theoretical value, and you just take the sum of the absolute values of the differences. And for our single bit sampling, it's about 5%. And for our uh, efficient uh, uh, sampling scheme, which is exponentially faster, it's about 15%. Uh, here's uh, uh, some other spectra. Uh, I think this is ozone starting with a different state. Um, but I want to emphasize that typical photo detectors, if you were to do this in ordinary optics, the photo detectors are not number resolving. They can tell you there were zero photons or not zero, but they can't tell you exactly how. It's difficult to know exactly how many photons there were. And also they're destructive, but they eat up, they, the, they consume the photons. So you can only measure them once. With our quantum non-demolition uh, bosons number sampling, where we, we make four measurements to see what the frequencies of the, see what the photon number is, we don't destroy the photons. We just flip an ancilla qubit if the photon number is present we're able to uh, do this much more efficient um, boson sampling. So we have uh, 256 uh, different photon states between 16 in each cavity. And uh, we make uh, uh, very efficient measurements. We get four bits of information on the photon number in one cavity and four bits in the other cavity. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge uh, uh, advantage in terms of uh, speed. So uh, I also want to emphasize that if you tried to do this simulation on a traditional <laughs> qubit-based quantum computer, well, uh, to get uh, eight bits of uh, inf information about the photon number, you'd have to have eight physical qubits and uh, more than one th to carry out that unitary transformation from one basis to the other, you would need more than 1,000 gates of very complicated multi-qubit gates, which is well beyond the capability of any existing traditional quantum computer. Uh, but was relatively simple for our quantum system, which consisted of only three qubits and two microwave oscillators. And the benefit of having actual bosons in your quantum computer is that they're very good at simulating uh, models that contain bosons, whereas qubits are very uh, inefficient for simulating uh, bosons. It turns out that simulating bosons is at least as hard, maybe harder in some sense, as simulating fermions, even though there are no minus signs. So for the future, uh, we're extending this to uh, anharmonic oscillators, uh, simulating those. We'll have a paper coming out soon. And um, as a theorist, I'm fantasizing about further in the future when we could simulate interesting, strongly correlated many body states for bosons. For example, um, one of my favorite things is the fractional quantum Hall effect. It's never been seen for bosons, only, only electrons. So could we build a lattice of microwave resonators and convince the photons to act like charged particles moving in a magnetic field? If we could do that, then we could see fractional statistics uh, of, uh, of photons and even non-abelian statistics. And it would be extremely uh, interesting. And we have all the pieces in place to do it. We could, in principle, we could build a array of microwave resonators and we could have beam splitters, which will allow the photons to hop from here to here to here to here. And we have a way of adjusting the phase of this hopping matrix element so that when the photon goes around a closed loop, it picks up a non-zero phase 
as if it were a charged particle moving in a magnetic field in a vector potential, and it picks up a Hirona Bohm phase. So we could convince the photons that they're charged particles hopping on a lattice in a magnetic field. And uh, we should, and we can also have them, the photons interact uh, by applying certain gates that we've developed called snap gates that would uh, impart um, like a Hubbard, uh, boson Hubbard model repulsion among the photons. So here you see an example of uh, we have two cavities, and we put a photon in one, and we swap it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between the two cavities. Uh, we need faster gates, longer coherence times. We need to be able to control the phases of all these beam splitters in a very large array, but that technology uh, is coming. We need to develop it in order to build any kind of uh, quantum computer large-scale quantum computer built on this technology. So that it's it's uh, almost ready, but uh, the experiment uh, could be done, I think, in a few years from now. So uh, I'll stop here and thank uh, the Sholkoff lab, and in particular, Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis, who did the, uh, mo the uh, molecule simulation. We collaborated with uh, actual chemists who taught us about molecular spectra. And uh, Ike Chuang helped us uh, estimate how much harder this calculation would have been to do on a qubit based computer. And uh, I also showed you some data on uh, GKP states from the Devere lab with whom I also collaborate. So I'm stopped there, and I'm happy to uh, to take questions. Thanks. So yes, there's a question from Imra Özbay, please. Professor Zerbin, thank you very much for this <clears throat> enlightening talk. I'm wondering about the uh, mapping between actual uh, chemical results or calculations and the quantum computer calculations. So how do you map the result? You said you just scale them. Is this a simple uh, linear operation or how do you do it? Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So um, it doesn't it doesn't actually matter. So if I know if I know the mechanical frequency of the stretch and um, uh, bending modes, and I know um, how many quanta there are in each mode, then I can calculate the energy. I know that because I I I I, I have solved the uh, the frequencies on a on a computer separately from this experiment. So I know the locations of these lines. Now, of course, the locations, you know, the energies in the microwave oscillator are completely different. But that doesn't matter. It's just the probability distribution that the when I eject, when I break one of these bonds, and I create three quanta in one mode and five in the other, that's all I have to get right. Because I can just rescale the microwave oscillator frequency trivially until it matches this. That this, the location of these peaks is known. It's only the probability. <clears throat> so this peak will correspond to so many photon, um, mechanical quanta in one mode and so many in another. Uh, I just have to get that part right to tell me the height of this line, the probability of this line. It's a it's a trivial rescaling to get the frequencies correct. Does that does that help? Yes, yes. So it's a simple yes. Thank you. Yeah. So are there other questions? Uh, there might be one in the chat. Uh, from Atalaya again. 
So there was an exponential gain with mapping to boson states. My question is, can it be worthwhile to try and find a quantum mechanical formalism which has the property of mappings between systems is easier? Um, let's see if I understand the question. So, uh, can you see the question? Uh, 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 let's see if I can see the question. Um, uh, chat. Oh, yeah, I can repeat. Um, so, so in order to simulate a boson system, you know, there's some large number of states that the system can be in. I can map those onto a large number of states of qubits, or I can map it onto the corresponding states of some other bosons, in this case, microwave bosons. Uh, and it turns out that very simple things like uh, the operator to create a photon, a dagger, uh, is uh, extremely hard to represent in qubits. You have to flip many, many qubits in a complicated way. Whereas it's a kind of native operation that's straightforward to do if you have actual physical bosons. So that's where we uh, get efficiency in simulating bosons is by having bosons in our computer. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Uh, perhaps if I like can uh, write back to us. If, yeah. If you... Okay. So there are two more questions. First, Sina, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thank hi. you for the nice talk. Um, yeah, I guess it's like a follow up question to the previous question, in a sense, or your answer, basically. So um, is it true then if I have qubits and I have a uh, this kind of um, parity uh, dependent or you know like the uh, an energy shift uh, dependent on the different uh, digits in the binary expansion of a yeah. number like is that really the main thing that if I have a interaction like in for instance Rydberg atoms or something where I could do uh, like parity measurements or I can do similar if I can use the different energy shifts basically if I can use the frequency bandwidth in this way, is it going um, to be efficient, or is there something? I'm not, I it, I'm not sure. It might be possible to do something. Um, the um, it's not so difficult. Suppose I wanted to represent a harmonic oscillator. I could have n qubits. Let's say four. And the frequency of the first one could be one, and the frequency of the second, you know, the transition energy could be two, and then four, and then eight. And then they would have, you know, their total energy would just be given by the binary number that those four bits, qubits, represent. So that's not so difficult, yeah. uh, I guess, in principle. Uh, but if you will look at, uh, suppose I have, uh, I want to destroy one photon. I want to change from 15 photons to uh, 14. So um, it turns out that, you know, so 15 photons is all four bits are one. And then 14 photons uh, uh I, I just have to, you know, remove yeah. remove one. But if you look at the arithmetic, sometimes many sometimes many bits flip when you lower the when you do arithmetic when you lower the number by one. 
and which ones to flip depend on what number they represented. So it's a very complicated multi-bit gate, which is expensive and right now impossible to do on with qubits. Oh, I I see. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I can maybe think a little bit more. Uh, Whereas I, if I actually have an oscillator, it's easy to apply. Um, a plus A dagger and A minus A dagger and so forth operators. I see, yeah. I was also thinking maybe, you know, like contrary to your example, maybe there's a separate like cavity-like qubit whose energy shift depends on, so they're not, it's not the energies of individual qubits, but the energy shift of the cavity in a sense, or like the energy shift of the, uh, the sensor qubit. Uh, yeah, that might is, that could you might be able to arrange such a Hamiltonian. So I, I don't think that's where the main efficiency gain comes from for us. I think it's the uh, squeezing and displacements are very easy to do yeah. uh, if you actually have bosons and very hard to do if you have qubits. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Shaki Ullah, please. Okay, thank you very much for such a nice talk. Uh, my question is, uh, you have applied uh, a phenomenon of boson sampling with number states. We know that uh, boson sampling is computationally efficient, but uh, could, could one apply Gaussian boson sampling, uh, for example, with squeeze states uh, because I think Gaussian boson sampling is more efficient than uh, boson sampling. So uh, it would be, and, and from my point of view, it would be better if you use uh, Gaussian boson sampling instead of boson sampling. Um, uh, so it's not, I think you don't mean efficient. I think you mean uh, uh, more uh, greater complexity for classical simulation. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, that's right. So if you have so if you have an array of beam splitters, um, the uh, and you put in um, coherent states, it's simple to calculate the coherent state amplitudes that come out on the other side. It's uh, the beam splitters. It's just simple algebra. But if you have, you need to, ha even with, uh, if you have, um, if you want to Squeeze measure state. the number, you have to do uh, something non-Gaussian. If you want to measure the number of photons in the output, okay. it's, that's where it's computationally hard classically. And it's some, I think it's somewhat harder if you use squeeze states because there's a bigger range of photon numbers. Uh, but you need something non-Gaussian to make it uh, uh, classically hard problem. Uh, so we, you know, we, people sometimes ask me, could we do a quantum supremacy experiment this way? Well, yes, in principle, but you have to get to uh, of order, I don't know, 50 oscillators with hundreds of photons before it becomes classically hard, really hard for modern computers. So th this is not, uh, this will not do that in the near future. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Sure, thank you, good question. So there is one request like question from Jehan Bulutai. Uh, Steve, yes, you uh, yeah, are you ready? Right, so he's just asking about opto mechanics. Uh, uh, so there's a lot going on in opto mechanics where you have mechanical oscillators coupled to microwave or optical light. Um, uh, some of the things that I'm excited right now are experiments by my Yale colleague, Jack Harris, who ha is using uh, liquid helium, superfluid helium as the mechanical medium. So he has two mirrors that trap the light, but
but they also trap the mechanical vibrations, the phonons, the sound waves in the helium. And he can get very strong coupling uh, between them. And he recently posted a paper measuring uh, high order correlation functions in the, in the, the you know, numbers of uh, phonons that he detects. And uh, I think there's a, a lot of interesting possibilities there for, for future experiments, including because the phonons have a very long lifetime, including um, uh, remote entanglement and, and things like that. So that's, that's one thing I'm interested in. In the microwave domain, um, there are experiments going on, uh, John Teufel and, and people at Jilla in Colorado, um, where they're trying to do um, entangle different mechanical oscillators with microwaves and also trying to do conversion of microwave photon states to telecom optical wavelengths. Uh, which would be very powerful for quantum communication. Okay. I see two raised hands. Um, Darren can go ahead. Okay, sure. Then uh, I'll go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about this uh, parity measurements that you made uh, yes. earlier in the talk. I think you're showing the screen now, actually. Yes. Um, when you make sequential measurements on the qubit, do you have to deal with some kind of back action on the, on the cavity? Uh, absolutely. Make... So, or do so you pre if, prepare and do like tomography style, or? Yeah. So if I if I apply this gate, so I I put um, a microwave tone which will flip the qubit if the photon number is one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, or fifteen. Then if the qubit flips, I don't know what the photon number is, but I know that it's odd. So then, of course, there's a major back action on the cavity, namely uh, all of the uh, even photon number amplitudes get set to zero if I find that it's odd. If I, if I had, let's say, a um, uh, coherent state where I have a Poisson distribution of photon number, and I ask, is the photon number equal to three, yes or no? Then if the answer is yes, that state collapses to uh, photon number three and nothing else. If the answer is no, then all the other amplitudes are unaffected, but you remove <laughs> the amplitude that it was three. And then you have to renormalize it. So there's a very interesting non-trivial back action on the cavity uh, that can completely or partially collapse the state depending on the measurement result. Does, is that what you were asking about? Uh, basically this and the fact that since you make, it looks like you make sequential measurements like after some interaction. And so does this, I guess that you have to take into account this effect when you make the next interaction to prepare for yes. the next measurement somehow. Yes, so um, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to, I didn't emphasize this, but these are quantum non-demolition measurements. And I'm okay. going to okay. keep, the, keep the qubit alive for four operations and four measurements. Everything is coherent. So in the first measurement, I collapse the state into, I, I remove, all the amplitude that the photon number is in the upper half of the range or the lower half, depending on the uh, measurement result. Okay. And so you sort of just say sift it, through the amplitudes. And then you, you get... say, let's say it's in the upper half. Then I, I, I collapse it onto the upper or lower half of the upper half. Yeah. And then the lower and upper half of that. And finally, I get you know down to, is it even or odd? And so okay. finally, I have collapsed the state to a single photon number. Great. It's pretty, yeah, it's so. pretty weird. <laughs> it's pretty nice, though. Yeah. And also for state preparation kind of thing, it's quite cool. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
And so I get a result every time, you know, I get four bits of information from which I can reconstruct the photon number that I measured. So it's very efficient. It's, it's exactly binary search, you know, are, is it in the first half of the phone book or the second half, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Yep. Sure. So there is one more raised hand. Perhaps we can get the two, Imre. Uh, yes, I think I, I'm going to take my question back, but uh, just to make sure I get it correctly, we are um, sampling from the cavity, right? We are trying to determine the number of photons in the cavity, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, I was just going to make a wrong uh, comment, but I take it back. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting is, remember, I'm, I'm not absorbing the photons to see if they're there. I'm using the fact that they shift the frequency of the qubit. And so I, if the qubit flips, when I apply a certain frequency, I know what the photon number was, but the photon is still there. So I can re, you know, I can still um, do further measurements to refine my knowledge of the exact photon number by doing this binary search. It does, however, require that everything stay coherent through the longer time that it takes to do all four of these operations, which is why it's 32 times faster, uh, but, but it's uh, somewhat less accurate than just, you know, slowly going through and uh, asking, is it one, is it two, is it three, is it four, in separate experiments, one app repeated millions of times. So uh, how tired are you, Professor Gurdon? Can I ask one last question? Oh, please, please. I'm, I, uh, I love questions, so thank you. These have been good. Okay, so uh, I will ask something about the last part of your talk about suppression point of all. Yeah. So I saw a recent paper of yours uh, on the archive, which is related yes. to the dissipative stabilization of uh, fraction point of states. Yes. It's saying that uh, it takes considerably long, longer time to prepare a fraction point of all state. Uh, compared to a multi-insulator state, perhaps, due to a fractionalization effect. Yes. Um, so how bad it is? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Are there the, any prospects of getting, for instance, non-abelian uh, states? Right. So the, the, the basic idea is that, you know, people, Bob Laughlin and, you know, people who, who studied the fractional quantum Hall effect for electrons, you, you don't have to worry about losing any of the electrons. But in, in the, I showed you that these cavities and qubits, you know, have finite lifetime. So you might lose one of the bosons. And uh, that's uh, a challenge for this kind of simulation. And there are, there are ways to engineer the bath, the, the environment, so that you can irreversibly, if you lose a photon, put a photon back and repair the state. It's a kind of error correction, if you will. But once you lose a photon, it's possible that it will split into two fractional charges, two half photons for the, uh, uh, depending on the particular quantum Hall state. And once they've separated from each other, then trying to, there's no room to put a whole photon into a space that only holds half a photon. <laughs> And so it takes a long time before those two come back together and you can refill. That's the basic idea of our paper. So uh, I, this is, um, it, it's going to require an ability to reef, if a photon is lost, to very quickly refill it with from the bath. But there's a speed limit on how quickly you can do it, which is set by the 
the excitation gap above the many body state. Uh, so it's it's a significant challenge, but I think um, it means that we, we we will be able to make such many body states, but they will have a few you know more defects than you might have expected from simple estimates. So is it realistic to expect some topological quantum computation using these systems? Um, I, yeah, I think, I think that will be very difficult. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine, it will not happen in the near future. Uh, if we can learn to make, uh, if we can learn to control extremely high quality cavities, it may be possible. So you can build microwave cavities that have lifetimes of two seconds. People who, you know, uh, who build particle accelerators with superconducting cavities can, can do that. Um, but the reason they have long lifetimes is they're very big. So the photons take a long time. To, they spend most of the time in vacuum and they don't spend a lot of time bouncing off the walls, which is where the, where the absorption occurs. Well, if they're very big in volume, that means that our qubits will now have trouble controlling them because the photons won't travel near the qubits very often either. But if we could solve that problem, then I think we could have very long lived bosons that wouldn't, in which you could imagine doing topological computation. But whether we can control the boson states strongly and rapidly uh, is a pretty big challenge because the more strongly you couple the qubits to them, the less likely you'll still have a two second lifetime <laughs> because the lifetime of the qubits is much worse than the lifetime of the cavity. So I, I don't, I'm pretty pessimistic that this can be done anytime in the near future, but boy, it would be a fantastic possibility if we could do it. Okay. So I think uh, there are no questions. Thanks a lot for this beautiful talk, Professor Gurman. Uh, and I think uh, it was a fantastic first day. So uh, good evening, everybody, and see you tomorrow at 10.20 uh, Istanbul time. Thank you all for your excellent uh, questions. I enjoyed chatting with you. Thanks a lot, Professor Gurman. Bye-bye. Yeah.